What is the future of quote unquote church buildings? Okay, what's the future of church buildings? Good question. Uh, well, if you read your Bible, Revelation chapter 13 uh, gives you the future of worship. Okay. Revelation 13, verse 12, Then he exerciseth, ex exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Where do you worship at? In house churches. Secretly in house churches that no one's allowed into. Only saved believers can worship in house churches. No. <laughs> no. And it's interesting, too, because you read in the... In the uh, you know, the next verse, well, actually, two verses later, verse 14, Deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by his sword and did live. And he gave power. It goes on to verse 15 there. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Now, what is that image? People say it's a statue. I don't believe it's a statue. I believe what it is is it's a large screen you know it's an image and you look in these big Babel buildings there are huge screens already in them and they're already preaching this new age Christ that doesn't judge people and that comes and makes peace and all this other stuff so what's going on there well I believe that the future of Babel buildings is they're going to be Antichrist worship centers most of them already are they're just waiting for the man to show up you know their their Christ has to show up and I mean, you talk to a lot of these people in these big Babel buildings, you say, what's coming up next? I believe Jesus is coming back. And they don't mean the preacher of rapture either. They're talking about their Christ, the Antichrist, coming back to the earth to bring peace, you know. And we're, we're going to have all the religions get together. We're all going to get along and all this other stuff. Yeah, uh -huh. sure, you're all going to get along and we're all going to go to hell. So the future, even if you want to stand and say, you know, I'm part of an independent fundamental Baptist church, and we're gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna bow down to this system, and we're gonna this. We're we're not 501c3, and we're doing. We have a Bible-believing pastor, and all this other stuff. You still have to realize what's going to happen to your Babel building after you leave. Even if every member is saved, let's say the pastor's a Bible believer, you're not 501c3. Every member's saved. It's just the most on fire building for the Lord, which nothing like that exists. I've been to many of them, and I've talked to brethren that have been around. Nothing like that exists. You know it. Don't kid yourself. But let's just say that there's one like that. What's going to happen to your building after you leave? Do you think Christians are going to be meeting there? Do you think tribulation saints, time of Jacob's trouble saints are going to be meeting there? They aren't going to be able to. You know what's going to happen there? They're going to be worshiping the Antichrist in that building. And you know, before you say, well, I don't care because after the rapture, who cares? I won't be here. That's a real wise philosophy. I mean, it's kind of like saying... You're at the grocery store and you're, you just got done checking out and you're walking out and you look back and you see in the corner there's a fire starting. And you go, doesn't bother me, I got my groceries. Is that the something that a good Christian would say? No. You should say, whoa, 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 wait a second here. There's a fire starting over there. Yeah. Guess what? There's a fire starting in the Babel buildings. And that fire is going to consume a lot of people in the lake of fire. You know, and it's, it's been said before, and I'm going to say it one more time. They say, well, uh, are you, mean to, you mean to tell me, Ryan, that uh, God's never used a church building? Well, let me ask you a counter question to that before I would answer that. Has uh, Satan used church buildings? You go down through the average town, those buildings that they call churches, who's used them more, God or the devil? Have more people gone to heaven or more people going to hell? I won't answer the question. You can answer it yourself. Next question. What about children's ministries? Oh, boy. What about children's ministries? You know, I'm going through this, this book right now by David Cloud against the house churches. He's against house churches, and he's like, the Bible's completely silent on the issue of uh, children's ministries. Uh, well, no, it isn't, actually. I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't have to come out and say by word, this is wrong. I mean, the Bible does not say, thou shalt not take methamphetamines. Thou shalt not uh, do bath salts. 
okay? Um, you can tell from the scriptures, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If any man defile the, the, the temple, him shall God destroy, okay? So does that apply to all the drugs and things that aren't specifically named? Well, of course. And the Bible over and over and over again talks about parents raising their children. At and home. how many at home? And how many children have been messed up in Sunday schools? Yeah. Lots of them. Lots and lots of them. Okay? You see, but there are good Sunday schools too. Yeah, but you see, it's never said in scripture for anybody. I mean, if you know, I can show you scripture after scripture it talks about raising up a child, the father that says about you know the son giving ear to the father and listening to the father and, and, and the counsel of his father and the counsel of his mother. You'll never see, I mean, show me one verse that says that anybody but a parent should be teaching the children. Show me one verse, okay? Children's ministries, again, I have a study on that. I'll put the link to it over here. Look at, the, look at that sermon and uh, search the scriptures, okay? Children's ministries are unbiblical. They are unnecessary, and again, what is the thing with children's ministries? 90% of the time, 99% of the time, it becomes worldly. And to and brainwash them to support Babel buildings throughout their lives and to just be conformists. Yeah, and what do they do? How are they getting them in? Especially bus kids ministries. They get them in with candy. They get them in with prizes. They get them in with all this other stuff. And then they say, when they grow up, they're going to be able to sit there still in the church service. And, you know, sure. Sure, you're using the world's methods to bring them in, but then when they get older, then they're going to give up the world's methods. I don't think so. Next question. What if a house church outgrows a house? Okay, what if a house church outgrows a house? Well, again, um, in this day and age, I don't think that's going to happen, but let's just say that uh, you guys got a really good group of Bible believers, and you're really on fire for the Lord, and you're really you know, doing some great tracting and witnessing and evangelism. And all of a sudden you realize, man, we got like 50 people coming here. We can't fit them all into this place anymore. And we got the money to get a mortgage to get a building. No. What do you do? You break off. Okay? You say, what in the Bible? They were meeting 150 people in the book of Acts and stuff like that. Yeah, and they met in an upper room. If you have a place, some place where you can meet 150 people in an upper room, go ahead. Absolutely. But they weren't meeting 150 people in the upper room to just come together every week and socialize. They were meeting there to organize, to go out and evangelize. And later on, you see, as time goes by, Paul's going, well, there's this guy with me, and this guy, and this guy, and that guy, and he's naming people. It's six people. Later on, Paul says, only Luke is with me. Two people. You know? And greet such and such, the household over there of, of Lydia and the, the household over here. And, and he's naming two or three people, groups of two or three people. And you say, well, that sounds like a failure. Oh, uh, no, that sounds like a success. You know what the most deadly soldier is on the battlefield? 20,000 Marines. No, no. Two snipers. You know, I studied military history sometimes and things like that. You get a sniper and a spotter together, the t sniper team together, they can go out and they can take out a military general. They can take out high-ranking officers. And regular foot soldiers are easy. I mean, that's just pff, no big deal. And the military fears sniper teams. When you're in a battlefield and there are snipers that can shoot over a thousand yards into your base, you don't even see them, and the next thing you know, some guy's dropping dead with a bullet. Okay? And you say, why are you saying all that? Because we are likened to soldiers. I'm not telling you to go out and shoot people with rifles, okay? Don't do that. But what I'm saying is, you get Christians together in this huge, big group. 500 people in regular attendance. 20,000 people in regular attendance. Bless God. Yeah, guess what happens to it? All it takes is a couple of devil drop a couple little bombs in there, and that whole thing just goes... <laughs> And just flattens right out. You say, give me an example. J. Frank Norris. Dr. J. Frank Norris, one of the greatest Baptist preachers that ever lived. 20,000 plus members in his church up in Detroit. It's now abandoned. The people are scattered. See? Well, you know what would have been better? Two people over here. Three people over there. Five people over there. Ten people over there. 
All those neighborhoods have people spread out all through them. Can you imagine if we had an army of Christian soldiers handing out tracts, gospel tracting, witnessing on the street, going out, preaching the word, putting out tracts, with the having all the information, free King James Bibles, free sermons on MP3 and all this other stuff, and we had that spread out every town, every city in America? Can you imagine that? You know, the Department of Homeland Security, I was reading a thing the one time, and they said the greatest terrorist threat is leaderless resistance. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Because that's exactly what Christianity is. You say, well, we have a leader. His name's Jesus Christ. Sure, but they can't attack Jesus Christ. And you see, what holds this together, what holds the body of Christ together, is the ideology of the Bible. You know what you're supposed to do. I don't have to be there present in your living room telling you what to do. I don't have to do that. You got a brother that's across three states over. He gets saved. You teach him the word and things like that. You send him material and whatever else. He now knows what to do. You don't have to go over and meet with him. See? Spread out. There again, old military doctrine. They would have uh, back in World War I, World War II, they would need to be... Well, not so much World War II, but World War I, they'd still come up out of the trenches and they'd rush a big line of men, you know, rushing the enemy. And you know what they told the soldiers? They said, don't clump up. Still true today. I can tell you from experience. Yep. My wife was in the I military. I was trained in that tactic. You never, ever do a ruck march in clusters because you are easy prey for the enemy. Right. Been yep. there, done that. So, now you heard it. Right from my wife's mouth. If you haven't heard her testimony, if you don't know who, what's going on there, she was in two branches of the military. So, before she got saved, Amen. if you're if you're a Christian woman, you have no business in the military. She didn't know she wasn't saved. But the point is, you have a Babel building with hundreds of people going to it, and this thing happens over and over and over again. The devil drops a bomb in there. One of the pastors has a zipper trouble, you know, or. Um, some kind of financial issue or whatever else and he's stealing money or something like that and boom it, it goes and then it splits again and it splits again and splits again next thing you know you go from 900 people down to 30 just like that why they should have been spread out see I mean you know I'm not too worried about what happens to Babel buildings in this area it's not gonna stop me I could care less oh there was a split over at such and such oh yeah whatever you know Hey, I just heard brother so-and-so just went out there by himself or with another guy and, and the two of them went out there and they put out 3,000 tracks this weekend while the Babel buildings in the area are busy doing the floor and mowing the yard and putting the pretty flowers out front to draw on the people. All right, next question. Are there any open condemnations against, quote-unquote, church buildings? Are there any open condemnations against church buildings? Well, this is another one that you're going to be told. They're going to say, the Bible doesn't openly condemn it. Well, first of all, that's not a good argument, okay? Because the Bible doesn't openly condemn uh, pornography by name. The Bible doesn't openly condemn methamphetamines. The Bible doesn't openly say, thou shalt not do heroin. Okay, um, there's the concept of it there. Okay, so that's at first, you know, the, the, in the first place, it's not a good argument. Okay, secondly, the Bible does condemn Bible buildings. You say, where? Can you prove that? Well, absolutely. Acts chapter 7, verse 47, it says here, but Solomon built him in house. Now, if you want to see a good Bible building, boy, let me tell you, money, no expense spared. Read the story about King Solomon's temple that he built. You want to talk about a, a temple of temples. That thing was built. Never are you going to see another temple out there. The Vatican, St. Peter's Basilica, nothing in this planet can compare to, to King Solomon's temple that he built for the Lord. And bless God, it lasted for 2,000 years, brother, preaching the word. It didn't even make it through Solomon's lifetime. 
Verse 48, Acts 7, 48, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? It's really kind of stupid when you think about it. Welcome to the house of God. Welcome to the house of God. Huh? Um, that's a pretty big sky up there. Uh, is God bigger than the sky? Yeah. You mean to tell me the God that's bigger than this, all this out here, you're going to build a place where he can go and reside? No. And you say, well, Brian, we, we just, we have a building where we meet. We don't associate it with God. Oh, yeah, you do. Oh, yeah, you do. I've been to the holy temples, okay? And you go in there, you know, you want to see it, do a little experiment. Just go in there and go up to the altar and just go, boom, and just throw it right over. Knock the communion plates off, say, oops, sorry about that. You're going to see people going, <gasps> you know, blaspheming the holy temple. And by the way, that's why they killed Stephen. He spoke against this holy place. They killed Jesus for the same reason. You see, what happens when you have this holy temple, this building where you go, this is where you meet God. And look at the high vaulted ceilings and all the chandeliers and the mirrors and the, and the gold plated everything. You get all, all, wow, oh. And all it takes is to get rid of the pastor there and you bring in the idols. Happens all the time, brethren. Is there no is there an open condemnation? Yeah, I just read you one. Acts chapter seven. Here's another one. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse fourteen. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Well, that depends on how many lost people you can invite on a Sunday. You say, Brian, that's about marriage. No, it isn't. Read First Corinthians chapter seven. If you're married to a lost man or woman and you're saved, the Bible says if they be pleased to dwell with you, you're not to depart. That's not about marriage. Instruction in righteousness, yeah. You shouldn't marry somebody that's lost. That passage of Scripture is about fellowshipping as believers. And it says there, you're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I mean, think about it. Sunday morning, everybody comes in. Oh, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Oh, this is your first week? Okay, well, here's a brochure. Here's the visitor's uh, welcome packet. Go sit down, and, and, and we're so glad to have you here. Okay, and they go and they sit down, and they're going, you know, I don't know, what's this all about? And, stuff. and they say, okay, welcome, everybody. This morning, we're going to stand up and sing hymn number 392. 392, saved by the blood of the crucified one. And they stand up and they go, saved by the blood of the crucified one. Now ransom from sin and a new work begun. Why are they singing that? They're not saved. And after a while they start going, I'm saved by the blood of the... Well, maybe I am saved. I go to church. You see? Very, very bad. And you can go on down there and... and uh, Read the rest of it. Verse 15, What concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you say, wait a second. Okay, whoa, 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 hold on. We got you now, Brian. It just said, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Aha, there is a temple of God today. You see? Right there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Praise the Lord, we proved the house church movement wrong. Keep reading. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, the lost people, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And it goes on to say, And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. How can you build a building and worship with lost people? How can you build a building and say, come on in, come on in. Oh, you're lost? You've never met the Lord? Okay, come on in. You can't do it. You can't do it. How can you be separate when you have a building that's open to the public? How can you be separate? You can't. You see how this tradition of Babel buildings has destroyed vital scriptures? And there are many, many more places we could go to and look at scriptures that say, you shouldn't be meeting together with lost people. All right? 
Let's go on to the next question. What purpose does a mature Christian have in the church? Okay. What purpose is does a mature Christian have in the church? Okay. Well, they need to be able to come and, and uh, you know, be friendly to the people and say, I've been going here for 50 years, and they just kind of warm the pew and, and whatever. No. Uh, you know, that's what, again, what does Babel buildings, what do Babel buildings lead to? They lead to people just coming and being comfortable and you just kind of do nice things around the place and, and you retire there and you just, you know, eventually they have your funeral. Old brother so-and-so, he went here for 60 years. Is that what you're supposed to do? Um, brethren, the Bible says there about Paul, he said, be followers of me even as I am also of Christ. We're supposed to follow Paul's example. Did Paul ever move to some place and just settle down and that's where he was for the rest of his life? No. No. You say, well, then I'm going to have to move around for the rest of my life. I didn't say that. What I said is, if you are a mature Christian, if you've learned the book, why are you staying, you know, I, I, I'm through basic training now, sir. What are my orders? We'll stay in basic training. Uh, well, sir, I'm called to fight. I'm... I'm I, I'm supposed to go to the battlefield, aren't I? Oh, no, no. Stay in basic training. Just stay there. Help the new recruits as they come through with basic training. Huh? No, you're called to fight. You're called to go out to the battlefield. And again, see how the Babel buildings cripple that? If you have a mature Christian, raise him up to the point of being an elder. Okay? And I don't mean necessarily even a, a, an age issue here. I'm talking about you get somebody who has been saved for a long time. You know, I mean, you, you get them in there, you train them the word, in the Word, and then they should go out and they should be discipling other people. They should be going out starting their own house church fellowships. You know, we again, let's, let's all just get together and let's just hold on to each other and let's hug each other until the rapture happens. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Okay, next question. Should Christians wear their best to the house church? <laughs> well... Again, we have this tradition thing that comes from the Catholics and uh, the thing of Sunday best. And, um, you know, again, there's no scripture for that. Uh, you aren't going to find any scriptures saying that you should wear a suit and tie or, you know, or even your best. Um, there's nothing really in there saying that you should do that. But ironically, there's actually a verse that says you shouldn't. It's actually condemned. James chapter 2. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly, what is a church? A called out assembly. So if somebody comes to your assembly, a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Verse 4, Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hmm. He goes on, verse 5, to say, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God jo chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Verse 6, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seat? Very, very true in the time of Jacob's trouble. You aren't going to be able to trust people that are rich. Because if you're in that time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to have your finances wiped out. Okay? And if you're saved, you're not going to be going into it. I realize that. But again, see, the system that we have now has to make this transfer over to that time then. So, all this Babel building stuff has to go away. So again, there's no scripture at all for wearing Sunday best. And you say, I want to give my best to the Lord for uh, two hours Sunday morning. Why aren't you giving your best to the Lord uh, seven days a week? Why aren't you giving your best to the Lord when you go to bed at night? Wear a suit and tie to bed. You say, well, that's absurd. Is it more absurd to go and wear the suit and tie thing when you go to church someplace? Not necessary, brethren. Not at all necessary. And you say, well, then we can just wear, you know, uh, just whatever we feel like wearing. Shorts and tank tops and stuff and sandals. No, 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 no. No. You should wear things that are respectable. I mean, 
like I have on right now, wear a decent shirt. You know, the women should wear dress in modest apparel because, see, a modestly dressed woman is going to cause lust and problems like that. Modestly dressed women, men that are also dressed modestly, because men can cause lust too, you know. And that's it. No special costumes for coming together to worship the Lord. So, next question. Are house church Christians lazy? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's another good one. Uh, you're lazy because you won't come down to church. You don't want to come to church, you know. Uh, no. Um, are there house church Christians that are lazy? I'm sure that there are. I'm sure that there are people out there that are just saying, you know, I don't want to be part of a fellowship because they're, they don't like to be challenged and they just want to sit around and do nothing. I, of course, there's always going to be bad things with any movement, okay? But to, to blanket all house church Christians as being lazy because they don't come to church, uh, again, you know, these people that say that, you, you're not, you need to get to church. Say, okay, I'll tell you what, I will go to your church if you can show me one verse of scripture that says the words, go to church or come to church. Show me one verse of scripture that says that and I'll be there tomorrow or be there next Sunday, whenever the next Sunday is. Here's a little hint, uh, it's not in there. Okay. And uh, as a house church Christian, you are now free from the tie of a Babel building you don't have that financial tie on you. You don't have that weekly tie on you of just like you have to be there every time the doors are open, you know, that all that stuff. You can go, you can fellowship with people any day of the week, okay? Any day at all, you can fellowship with other brethren. And you can go out, you can track, you can witness, you can do whatever you want and be active and busy for the Lord. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to go do something tracting or witnessing or whatever else and it was just like, no. You got to get to the Babel building. There are things that you have to do. So um, that'll be it for that one. What's the next question? Are house church Christians required to have a weekly meeting? Okay. Again, you see that. You see in, in the book of Acts, Paul there, he meets with some of the brethren at night. He preaches all night long to the next morning, till break of day. And then he departs. Again, you know, last night we were, we're meeting with this other couple and things. I met them just a couple days ago. And it was like the very next day, you know, hey, come on over. We want to fellowship with you. We'd like to talk to you. What are your beliefs and things like this? And and uh, I believe they're saved and everything. And, and uh, But we were there and, and it was just like, you know, they had small children. And, and so we were like, well, you know, we got to get going here. But if they wouldn't have had small children, we would probably talked all night. <laughs> you, get to, you get together. I mean, if you've never experienced that, where you get together and you don't have that set time. And man, I'll tell you what it is a glorious thing where you get together with brethren and it's just like, let's just talk about the Bible. I just want to talk about the Word of God. Hey, you want something to eat? Well, yeah, sure, that'd be great. You know, let's let's get some food and whatever. And, and, you know, you don't have to do that. That's not a requirement. You don't have to make this required thing of eating every week or whatever. You know, fellowship. Come together. Say, hey, how do you believe? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And let's go through the Bible. Hey, would you guys want to go out tracting sometime? Would you, you know how to do that? Let's go out. Let's do that. You want to do this? You, I got a friend that needs to be witnessed to. And, and would you want to come with me and witness to him? What a glorious thing. Okay. Don't get tied to these buildings. That's, that's the whole thing. I keep trying to get through to people with this thing. So anyhow, next question. What about choir and special music? Hmm. You know, choir and special music. Oh boy. Uh, again, my experiences with that has always been pride. Um, there's a lot of pride that goes along with that, you know, especially if you if you're ever in a place where they're applauding, they're clapping for somebody or saying touchdown. Yeah, we were at one place at the Baptist uh, Babel building and, and the pastor's wife would scream touchdown after somebody sang, you know, uh, not fleshly there at all. Um, <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, uh, again, holy to do that. yeah, again, you know, it's it leads to carnality to, you know, to exaltation of the flesh. And, you know, I'm all for the assembly singing, you know, having hymns. You see that in the New Testament. They're meeting together. They sing a hymn. They, they pray together. They, you know, talk about plans for evangelism or whatever. Read the scriptures together. Instruct people in the scriptures. But uh, this special music thing, it's just not, it's not based in scripture. Uh, it is there in the Old Testament. There's a thing of, of you know, you do see some of that in the Old Testament, 
but there's no tie into the New Testament with it. There's no, let's bring this thing into here. And, you know, they had a temple in the Old Testament, and look what happened to it. So, should there be special music? No, I don't believe so. Um, you know, you say, well, I have a musical ability, Brian. What am I supposed to do with it? Here's a thought. Get a hymn book, open that thing up, and start recording your hymns that you're playing with whatever instrument you play. Record the old hymns. A lot of those old hymns are dying. A lot of those old hymns, you look at I, I look in a hymn book and I'm going, I don't even know what this hymn does. I, I, don't, I can't read music. I look at it and I say, I don't even know what that hymn is. I've never heard it before. What a beautiful thing it would be if some house church Christians would get together and say, you know what, as part of our ministry, we're going to invest in a cheap little recorder, some kind of a little thing that we can record. H2 recorders, or, or I have one right now on my side here. They're very inexpensive, less than $200. And they record very, very well. Get yourself a, a nice little room and, and play your instruments and, and put out a little CD or something like that. Give them out. You know, there again, brethren, the old hymns are disappearing. The old hymns are disappearing. How wonderful it would be to say to somebody, hey, you know, you just got saved. Here's the right kind of mis music that you should be listening to. There you go. Instrumental CD. You can listen to that thing at work when you're driving someplace wherever. I would love to have somebody come out and make instrumental CDs, piano or whatever instrument, of all the old hymns. I would love that. You know, so many of the instrumental C CDs that are out there, you start listening to them and they start to throw in the, the beat and the, and the rock and roll sound and everything. It's just like, well, turn it off. You know, so, next question. What about missionaries? Okay, what about missionaries? Very good question. Um, here again, uh, how many missionaries could you support if you had $500,000? A few. You know, so then why are you spending $500,000 on a building when you could be giving that money to missionaries to send them out? And let's just say, okay, you have your church group there and um, you're getting bigger and you're evangelizing and getting people saved and you're spreading out and everything. And, and one of the brethren says, you know, I just got this letter from somebody over in Germany and uh, boy, they really need help over there. You say, Wow, Germany's a bit of a drive, isn't it? You know, <laughs> yeah. And uh, they say, I've been studying the German language and, and, you know, I can speak it fluently. And I uh, just, I wish I could go over there. You say, well, you know what? Let's pray about that. And you come together as a group, as a, as a church, and you say, you know what? Let's send you over there. Hey, everybody, we're going to pitch in. We're going to send brother so-and-so and his wife and children over to Germany. And they send you over. You say, oh, that sounds expensive, but it's a whole lot cheaper than paying for a battle building, paying a mortgage. And you can say, let's get our little group here together. We can support you with X amount, you know, whatever amount a month. And you go on over there and you live. We'll pay for your, your plane ticket. We'll pay, pay for everything. You go over there. You send the reports back of what's going on. Maybe the Lord, you get over there and you say, well, I kind of had a, a false impression here. Yeah, it's, I'm not called here and stuff like that. Well, pass out some tracks while you're there. Come on back. You know, again, why does it have to be this official thing of, you know, we have to have a Bible building to send missionaries out? It's just not there. Again, what does the Bible say? You know, next question. Are house church Christians social outcasts? <laughs> well, I can answer that with another question. Are Bible believing Christians show social outcasts? Uh, yeah, you know, you will be hated, you will be despised, you will be put down. And uh, if you're a house church Christian, you will get Hebrews 10.25 thrown at you time and time and time again. You will get that you're, you're wicked, you're not legitimate, you're not this, you're a tax fraud, you're, you're all this other stuff. Um, that's the way it's going to be. And you say, well, uh, but, you know, house churches are made up with, of disgruntled Christians that have gone, they're, they're church jumpers, and then they're just disgruntled, and they just pretend that they're going to stay at home, and they don't have legitimate churches. Uh, no, that doesn't work. You see, again, they, there's no such thing as a legitimate church and an illegitimate church. The church is the people. Okay? The people, the people, the people. They say, you're not going to church. How can I go to some place where that I'm in all the time? Let's define things by the Bible. 
The Bible says, I am part of the church 24-7. So there can be no such thing as an illegitimate church. And if God calls you to go someplace and, and you go and you've been to every Bible building in the area and there's nothing any good and you're just like, I'm frustrated, and you go home and you sit down in front of the internet and you start to listen to preaching and you get established in the Word, that's not illegitimate. I mean, you look at the Bible and the Bible, Paul is sending letters to people. Okay? I'm not entertaining. All right? I am preaching the Word through the medium of video. And I'm not going to make all the fancy special effects movies and stuff like this and whatever. I use effects occasionally, but it's very, very minimal. You know, why? I don't, I don't want to go away from preaching. You know, I want to be able to teach people the Word of God. And when you get to a point where you can do that yourself, hey, you learn the Word of God and you say, I want to start meeting with other people and, and have a house church of my own, you know, contact some of the brethren and have the lists there and put yourself on a list. And say, you know what? I'm available to anybody that comes near the city here. I can meet with you. Whatever. You know? So, you're not going to get away from the thing of, of people labeling you as a social outcast. Okay? That's, that's just not going to happen. I mean, you've you got to get past this thing of, of uh, pleasing men. It, it's just, you're never going to be popular with this movement. Um, just as they weren't in the first century. You know? I mean, keep this in mind, brethren. When you get to heaven, you're going to want to have something in common with most of the people that are there. And for 1,700 years, no Christian ever met in a Babel building. Okay? And the ones that met after that were ones that were very ignorant of the issues and things like that, and they just fell in line with the whole system. So again, most Christians down through the centuries met in homes or in fields or wherever else. Okay? Next question. That's all I have on my list. That's it. Amen. All right. That will be it for the House Church FAQs. If you can think of any other questions that you have on the issue of house churches, um, put them down in the comments section down there, and we will maybe make a part two to the House Church FAQ thing. But uh, it just, brethren, as time goes by, you're going to see more and more that it's just not even an option anymore. I mean, we got to start getting out of these Babel buildings. The control is coming. It's, it's, you know, the sodomy agenda is going to come down on the Babel buildings, and they're going to be controlled. And the people that are going there, you will be forced to go along with that system. You know, and I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of the guys that are in these places, they are hirelings. And the reason that you find a, uh, a good church is because he doesn't condemn the things that you're doing that you know are wrong. Yeah. And so, you know, it just, it's going to become more apparent as time goes by. And of course, if you read scripture, if you read and you see things, you look at things prophetically through the lens of scripture, you will see that in the time of Jacob's trouble, anybody who's saved in that time, they can't be meeting in a public place. They can't be. And, they, and the change is not going to happen, boom, at the rapture. We're all meeting in church buildings and then boom, rapture, and then everybody goes to underground. It isn't going to happen that way. There's going to be a great deception, a great lie that's going to come. And before that time comes, I believe true Christians are going to have to go back to worshiping at home and away from these Babel buildings with all the spiritual problems that are attached to them. Okay? So that's going to be it for this video. Like I said, if you have any questions we didn't answer, down in the comments section. So that's it. Thank you for watching.